Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-4 task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. Good morning and welcome to Talking Therapy. My name is Marvin Goldfried and my very esteemed California colleague is... Alan Francis. Alan Francis. Good luck with your unpacking, Alan. This is going to be an ongoing <laughs> type of endeavor. You're a, you very, see, you're a very pleasant break from having to go through the box. Well, okay. I appreciate that. But, you know, you should write a book, Zen and the Art of Unpacking. <laughs> you know, we well, have motorcycle uh, yeah. maintenance, it, it, and we have tennis, it, and we have skiing. It's also sort of un unpacking your life. So the part that makes it complicated. Is well, that's the good back. news already, because you, it means you're alive. And that's the Zen approach. Anyway, that's for another podcast. But, but today you said you wanted to talk a bit about your views of, uh, I don't know, for psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic therapy, psychodynamic therapy, dynamically oriented into whatever, whatever the terms are, and however you view it, I'd uh, love to hear your views. Well, I think what, what I've done is listed 12 different core elements of psychodynamic therapy. And I think it'd be really interesting as I go through them briefly each, get your reactions based on other experiences that you come with to see whether they're really that different. Because my hypothesis oh, is- Sounds good to me. Okay, so the first thing is a quote from Einstein. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I have equal distrust for those analytic therapists who complicate simple clinical problems that could be dealt with in a short period of time with simple techniques and instead have the patient be in, in long-term therapy analysis for years to years. I, I distrust them, but I also distrust therapists who tend to see things, everything, everything through a very simple tunnel vision lens. And every problem is a simple problem and everything can be solved very quickly. Didn't Freud say that when people commented on, on his smoking, his Schimmelfenic cigars, these long, thin cigars, right? Just sometimes the cigar is just, just a cigar. cigar. Yep. And he also, one of his last uh, monographs written in 1937 was titled Analysis Terminable and Interminable. Uh -huh. He was against the fact that analyses were stretching out forever. He said we should deal with the conflicts of ha at hand and not be too perfectionistic. So I'm, I'm really very much opposed. When I refer to people, I worry about referring to someone who may take a simple problem and make it five years of work. On the other hand, I'm worried about people who take a complex problem and try to solve it in three weeks. I think you have to, as Einstein said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. That's interesting. That's an interesting commentary on both psychoanalytic therapy and the way CBT is often performed nowadays, where one may be overly complicated and the other may be overly simplistic. And actually what's happened, I think, is that both have sort of converged, that psychodynamic therapies for the past hundreds of, hundreds of years have developed short-term versions, focal versions right. of psychodynamic therapies, often done in 12 sessions. So 12 session psychodynamic therapy is a wonderful technique. And I sometimes do 15 minute psychodynamic <laughs> uh, treatments in emergency rooms. And at the same time, cognitive behavior therapy got to realize that there were underlying schema that couldn't be solved in very short periods of time. And CBT therapies got longer and longer and dealt with more complicated problems. 
Well, the truth, and, and, and you know, we're off on a tangent, but then what else is new? Isn't that true of all of our podcasts? Um, practicing CBT therapists don't do it according to the research. Uh, they, they do it based on what is, you know, what is needed. And my CBT colleagues, and, and including myself, we see people for long periods of time, you know, some, and sometimes because the, the problem keeps reoccurring in other situations and needs to be dealt with, and sometimes other issues come up. So it's, the research is not really clearly, at least in CBT, reflecting what goes on clinically. Clinical practice tends to converge regardless of orientation. Yeah. Yeah. People's ideas and research may be quite different, but when they're confronted with real life situations with patients, they tend to act pretty much alike. So the okay. second, the second uh, core element would be that there isn't a struggle choosing between nature and nurture, that life is and human nature is a complicated interaction between what we're born with and how we interact with our environments. The permutations are endless. And that the best way of understanding people is to have a broad biopsychosocial model that doesn't emphasize unduly a reductionistic attachment to biology, to psychology, or to the social context, but tries to integrate and understand the ways in which these are constantly interacting. Sounds a lot like George Engel at Rochester. Yeah, it actually was the biopsychosocial model was actually Adolf Meyer's contribution. Oh, to that's it. true. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the way more than 100 years ago. And Engel was the person to name it in 1977. Any problems with that from your point of view? No, um, I think anyone who has children knows that there are differences that occur at, at birth, constitutional differences. My kids are totally different, totally different in, in many ways, and were that way when they were very young. We have an experiment in nature in my family. We have identical twin boys who are now uh, 17 and a half. And although they're very different in many ways, especially in intelligence and sense of humor and vividness, they're remarkably different in all sorts of other ways. Mm. So that they had the same genes, but you could tell almost from birth that they had different personalities. Yeah. Not completely different personalities, but major differences. And, and I think this shows the, the complexity that DNA is not destiny and that the environment, the physical environment from the moment of conception uh, to, to the rest of, of life and the emotional environment throughout life is a tremendous contributor to variation amongst people. You know, as you're saying this, it's occurring to me that this becomes an extraordinary, I have, at least clinically, I found this to be an extraordinarily important part of therapy that I do with socially anxious people who were socially anxious at birth, constitutionally inhibited. And what, what happens is by the time they come into therapy, you know, there's been all kinds of other learning experiences, but basically they're blaming themselves. Mm much like a borderline, you know, who's been blamed. They're blaming themselves for being socially anxious. And what I say to them, if you're going to blame yourself that it's your fault, then why in the world did you pick your parents? <laughs> because, you know, they passed this on. It's their fault. Yeah. And then, of course, this gets into a cognitive restructuring dialogue where they say, well, I didn't pick my parents. And then we talk about how, well, then, you know, why are you blaming yourself? If they, you know, if you didn't pick them, blame your parents. And then, of course, they say it's not their fault. And, but anyway, this is a long roundabout way within my intervention of getting them to, to put their energies into to changing rather than self-blame. Yeah, Jerry Kagan did the remarkable experiments yes. showing that even before kids were born in utero, differences in response in heart rate response to external oh, really? stimuli predicted later on which kids would be more anxious and which would be more exploratory. That you could actually differentiate kids before they were born on their anxiety level 
And it was a pretty good predictor. He followed the kids for 21 years, I think maybe even longer. It was a pretty good predictor, their initial heart rate response in utero. Wow. I didn't know that. I know that, that he did early studies where when they were, you know, prior to one year old, their tendency predicted later fears. Yeah, yeah. And, and those kids had the ones at one year old who had later fears were the ones most likely in utero to have a heart rate response that would be greater than normal. Yeah, yeah. So we're born with certain proclivities and temperaments that are then shaped by our experiences. And that brings up number three, that the child is father to the man. Mm -hmm. the quote from Wordsworth's poem that the early life experiences are very formative in the way we will later think, feel, uh, behave, and interact with other people. Was Freud the first one to, to really uh, underscore that? No, well, the quote was from, uh, from Wordsworth, which would be 100 years or 80 years before Freud. Who, who was that? I didn't hear that. Wordsworth, the poet. Oh, Wordsworth. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. And actually, it goes all the way back, I think, to, um, to the ancient Greek uh, philosopher, to Aristotle and to... Um, the, uh, the the ancient Greek philosophers. I don't think it's a it's a brilliant insight that mm -hmm. we're very much formed by our early life experiences, but it's an insight that has sometimes been lost by psychotherapists who were exclusively focused on the present. That you can be too focused on the past and miss what's happening now, but you can be too focused on the present and not see how the past is influencing the present. Yeah. No problems there. No, no, um, quite the contrary. I mean, it's something I have advocated to my uh, fellow CBT therapists when they said, we don't deal with the past. We don't talk about the past. Well, I think that's short, that, that's short sighted. I think they misunderstand that notion of the emphasis on the past. Because when we broke from psychoanalytic therapy, uh, back in the in the fifties and sixties, and we said we're not going to spend a lot of time reliving the past and reliving unresolved conflicts. It didn't mean that we were uninterested in the past. I mean, for certain kinds of things, we were not interested. If it, if you have a snake phobia, we you know we don't know where that came from, or public speaking anxiety, or other kinds of phobias. We don't know where that came from, uh, but we know how to change it. But for other more complicated problems, it's very important to know the social learning history because it alerts us to aspects of a person's functioning, you know, triggers, uh, vulnerabilities that we might not otherwise uh, understand. So we would both be suspicious of therapists who deal too much with the past and miss what's happening now. Yeah. But equally, we would worry about therapists that who think that it's not important to know the context in which the current symptoms are occurring. So far, so good. This is going to be very boring because I'm going to well, agree with It's really interesting because it, we could not have had more different educational experiences, but our clinical lives brought us together. to That's see. True. So the fourth thing would be what Freud called the repetition compulsion. The idea that once we have a given way of seeing the world, of thinking, of feeling emotions, of behaving in certain ways, and of interacting with other people in certain ways, it's very hard to change that. And we bring that pattern of behaviors and feelings and thoughts and uh, social interaction tendencies into every new relationship. So each new relationship, each new experience will be very much colored by us repeating over and over again, the same patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting. Yeah, no, sure. There are, and again, there's there's a slight difference here with with uh, some CBT people when it comes to the question of patterns. You know, because the, there's a, there's a deeply rooted philosophy is behavior is specific to a specific situation, and this goes back to the '60s and behavior therapy. But the fact that the, there are patterns means that behavior is not specific to the situation and the person is not reacting appropriately to the situation because they are, because their behavior and functioning is part of a pattern. So, um, no, 
Um, I mean, I totally agree that the, the notion yeah. of, of, of patterns. And There's been this long and I think pretty fruitless debate about personality versus social context. And you can design experiments in which people will almost all do the same thing, showing that, oh, it's not personality, it's social context, or that people will do different things in different situations, showing that it's not a solid, pervasive personality level of functioning, but depends on the situation. But you can also do experiments and see in daily life the fact that people tend to bring a tremendous force of, of their own past into each present relationship, each <laughs> present situation. So we wouldn't, I think, want to believe that personality completely determines people's behavior, devoid of social con contextual triggers. On the other hand, I think it would be silly to think that people have no influence on the way they see the world and everything is based on those triggers. That both of us would find the middle ground between personality is everything on the one hand and the social context is everything on the other. Well, so far, you know, I agree. I don't know if we could get agreement on this, but it would be interesting to take some of these points and, and do a survey to see how much agreement there is. I, I would suspect there's more agreement there than, than some people might think. The fifth point would be about consciousness and how much are we aware of our motivations and understand our behaviors, how much of our behaviors are sort of built in and hardwired and our consciousness is either unaware of what's motivating them or has excuses or rationalizations for what's motivating us. Yeah. So Freud's contribution, which wasn't at all unique with him, again, all this goes back to Aristotle and to philosophers since the dawn of time, but he emphasized, and Darwin especially, Darwin was particularly influential in emphasizing the role of un the unconscious, that we weren't aware of how much of our behaviors were instinctively hardwired. Yeah, yeah. So how much of our behavior is based on just conscious thought, conscious uh, reactions? How much of our motivations are outside of our conscious awareness? The difficulty I have is the term the unconscious and the reification of that. And I think that's a, that's a difficulty uh, that, that I have with uh, lots of Freudian notions and, and the difficulty I have with, with most forms of therapy, the words that, that are used don't always fully describe the clinical phenomenon. And we spend too much time learning about therapy through words rather than observation of phenomenon. So if you're in a, you watch a session and the patient is talking to the therapist and, and the therapist says something, and then the patient says, you know, I just realized why, what my motivation is for doing X and then describe something. Now, what kind of therapy would that be? Is, does that not happen in all forms of therapy? I think it does. But does that mean, oh, we now believe in the unconscious? So it's the, it's the label that, that gets me. It's a kind of reifying it as if it exists. If it, it exists. And it's yeah. another person in there that we're just not aware of, rather than it's just that we have many behavioral and emotional and yes. tendencies. That's right. Yeah. No. So you're, you're against reification. Right. But this, if you just describe without then putting it into some complex theory, I think we're more likely to get agreement. Case in point, I don't know if I ever told you this. Uh, I had a colleague at Stony Brook, Howie Racklin, who you never heard of, but he was probably one of the most uh, arch Skinnerians that, that there could, could ever be. Uh, Anyway, long story short, we both lived in New York, so we would commute together by car. He would drive and I would, you know, we'd go from Stony Brook to New York. And once I was talking about panic and agoraphobia, and he started giving his point of view from a Skinnerian point of view. And I said, Howie, you sound very psychodynamic. For example, he would say, well, the leader of my school, Skinner, said that people are often unaware of what motivates their behavior. Okay, yeah, they're unaware of the reinforcements and the contingencies. So what we did is we had a little uh, a dictation recorder and I recorded an interview with him. 
And then we changed all the jargon into ordinary language and sent it out. Most people thought he was psychodynamic. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that one of the problems is jargon that people tend, and I love the Alice in Wonderland Jabberwocky section, fighting the, the Frumius Bandersnatch. People tend to attach more weight to words than they really can carry. Yeah. And that if you eliminate, I, I really believe that you, can, you should be able to be a psychotherapist and a teacher and never use a jargon term, never use a jargon term with patients, never use a jargon term with students. And the less that there are the, the use of these shorthand jargons, the more the common language, it becomes clear that we're much more alike than we are different. Jargon yeah. separate, the Tower, Tower of Babel. It's very, very hard to get people to, professionals, to not use jargon. Very, and very hard. Anything that can't be explained simply probably isn't worth explaining. So we're and back to and any number one. And any therapist who can explain things simply, if, if, as an advice to patients, if you go to a therapist and he can't explain to you in a way that makes sense to you what he thinks is going on, mm -hmm. probably, not, probably not a good therapist for you. Okay, the next thing is the role of insight. So what was that last point again? It was... Uh... We, oh, we're, we are not always aware of those things that motivate our behavior. Right. Consciousness was the fifth. So, so to rehearse, we've discussed the four things we've discussed so far. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. That we, the biopsychosocial model of personality, that the child is father to the man, and the uh, repetition of behaviors. And the fifth thing was consciousness. We're not going to have time to do all today. Maybe we can do five or six. The sixth thing I was going to bring up out of 12 is insight, the role of insight. Freud's idea was that the, possi the strong possibility that if people understood their unconscious motivations, they would no longer be trapped by them. That the, to the degree that our motivations are unconscious, they control us. And that once we understand them, he was very didactic when his therapy yeah. he, he was constantly teaching people about their unconscious wishes. He had the notion, which has turned out not to be that accurate, that insight by itself would be healing. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm translating uh, in my head. I've got a little Google app in here that translates jargon into ordinary English. So tell me if this is what you're saying. Um, Yes, people are often unaware of what causes them to behave in ways that are problematic. But once they become aware of what is causing them to become pro problematic, once they have this awareness, it provides them with a guideline to help them change their functioning so, they're less, so it's less problematic in their current lives. The only thing I'd add is it sometimes helps. So sometimes there's an aha moment yeah. where the conscious becomes conscious. You realize that you've been following certain patterns of behavior your whole life that make no sense. And you're able to take control of what were previously uncontrollable uh, emotions and, and motivations and change. Yeah. It only happens sometimes. Sometimes you have that aha moment. Right. And you understand yourself better, but you remain exactly the same. Yeah. And I think that the point here is that insights, whether you call them psychodynamic insights or you call them cognitive reframings, yeah. be enormously valuable when they work. Yeah. But they don't always work. And they don't always work, work, right. Sometimes more yeah. is needed. I, I'm remembering trying to understand when I first read Freud what was meant by where it is there shall ego be. That's like, oh, my God. Talk about, you know, the first principle. And, and uh, Einstein would not be happy <laughs> with, with that one. But, you know, after, good God, is it like 60 years that I've been in the field counting graduate school? After 60 years, I finally understand what it means. If you don't talk about ego and id, but if the translation is more accurate to the German of ich and s than it's I and it. So the behavior of the individual, well, I don't know what it is. It overcomes me. 
And then there's a realization, well, no, it's not that it overcomes me, is that I just confuse this other person with somebody from the past. And I'm reacting that same way. So it's using one's metacognitive ability to understand the problems or the causes of the problems, going from what I've described as unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. Now I know the factors that are causing me to have problems in my life. And Freud had developed a very complicated biological model based on, he had been a lab rat himself. He was a neuropathologist, quite excellent as a neuropathologist before he became a clinician. He had a complicated biological model of drives, especially sexual drives, yeah. to explain symptoms, to explain personality. That model was just completely wrong. But modern cognitive neuroscience and brain imaging confirms the basic idea. Yeah. The basic idea being that there's a level of unconscious functioning that we're not aware of. Yeah. That tremendously influences our behavior. Yeah. And then there's conscious functioning that tries to explain to us why we're behaving and why we're feeling the way we feel. That these can be isolated to some degree in different parts of the brain. Yeah. And the forebrain has the latest evolutionary development is that part that we call the I, but that the more primitive parts of the brain that are so controlling of our behaviors and our emotions that he would have called the it or the id. I agree. As long as, Alan, don't call it unconscious because it makes me nervous. <laughs> I have an emotion, negative emotional reaction to certain terms. But when you put it in another way, I have absolutely no problem. So I, you know, I, outside of awareness help? Yes, not always aware of what motivates their behavior. I can, ta I can take that. I can take that. Okay, maybe one more thing and then we'll stop okay. today. And that is that insight very often by itself only cures ignorance. We've discussed that before. It doesn't always change behavior. And the great contribution of Alexander and French and other uh, psycho analytically oriented therapists going back about 70 or 80 years, and Fenichel originally going back 100 years, was to emphasize the corrective emotional experience. Yes. We've discussed before in sessions. That's not just a matter of, oh, I understand myself and now I'm going to be completely different. There has to be a deep change in the repetitive patterns that you've established in the past with a sense of a new experience that somehow allows you to go into the future, not repeating the same things over and over again in the way right. that had right. previously been automatic. Absolutely. And that, that was the point that um, uh, Paul Wachtel made early on in his book, uh, Action and Insight, where he's, he's, he was, he gravitated as a psychoanalytic therapist um, to learn more about behavior therapy because he recognized that insight or awareness was, was not enough. Uncovering, as he put it, the woolly mammoth and seeing it for the way it is, is not the end of therapy. That action is needed. So, I mean, basically, this is what we spoke about in another podcast. If you let me have the last word on this, is it okay? Yes. Where the person goes from unconscious incompetence and has insight and awareness, and then it's conscious incompetence. They're aware of what is wrong, what is causing the problems. The next step is for them to take action and do things differently and have corrective experiences. And it's a deliberate way of changing functioning. And that's the corrective experience. And that brings them into conscious competence. And so, then with practice and working through, it becomes more automatic and hopefully there's an unconscious competence. So I think the things we're discussing so far today is core psychodynamic con concepts and techniques really are core psychotherapy concepts and techniques. And the point I guess both of us are making uh, is that to be a competent therapist, you have to be in the middle with enough of the skill set so that you're not at the extreme of emphasizing just the past, not the present. You're not the extreme of emphasizing what the person's not aware of versus what he is aware of. 
you're constantly following the patient with common sense and with a deep awareness that life is complicated, but can also sometimes be made simpler in a way that will enlighten the patient. Well said. Okay. We'll do the rest I, next I, week. I, I defer to you. You just had the last word, but that's okay. okay. We'll do more next week. We'll do more. Absolutely. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.